So hello everyone and welcome to the 16th uh, Argos community call. Today we have colleagues from uh, Artspace with us who we will, who will be presenting and discussing integrations with, uh, with Argos. Um, as always, we've prepared a, a notes document during the presentations, feel free to add your questions so we can address them there or raise your hand uh, if you want to, to ask something. And yeah, without uh, further delays, uh, I'll pass the floor on to Eli, service manager, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Athena. Thank you. Um, thank you also, uh, Rory and Rob, for being here and everyone. This is our first community call of 2024. Uh, and we're starting with uh, we're starting strong with some integrations that uh, we have uh, done some collaborations uh, to show um, something that we achieved last year uh, with uh, our space. Uh, you will hear more about our space from um, uh, our colleagues uh, Rory uh, McNeil and Rob Day uh, who are working there um, and how we. Um, integrated with, well, they uh, used Argos to uh, find the DMPs uh, inside our space, add them in their collections with other um, data uh, and uh, other uh, things that they might be working on, and then how you can uh, publish this uh, while maintaining uh, the PID, so uh, the PID of the DMP and getting the uh, PIDs uh, for the whole collection of um, data and the uh, whole view that you have in the RSpace collection. So uh, thank you very much for joining. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to this presentation and demo. We'll start with uh, you, Rory, with the presentation. So um, I I'll just stop talking and we can, we can start and we can have this nice discussion after. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Ellie, and thank you, uh, thank you very much for inviting us. It was uh, really interesting working with uh, with you and others on the Argos team last year on the integration, and we learned a lot. And uh, it's actually really exciting that to have an opportunity to share what we've done with uh, with the Argos community. So yeah, so thank you very much. So yes, um, so I'm Rory, and and Rob uh, is here as well, and. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, so today what we're going to do is divided, in, my, my presentation is going to start off and then Rob will actually give you a demo of a brief demo of, of our space, but mainly focusing on the Argos integration. And the presentation has two parts because I realize some of you may be familiar with our space, but others won't be familiar with our space. So the first part of the presentation is an overview of our space. And then the second part of the presentation is describes uh, briefly the Argos R space integration, which Rob will then get into in more detail. Next slide, please. So the problem we're addressing, and I think actually when I say we, I mean Argos as well as R space, is that uh, there's uh, overall there's a lack of of data centric tools, tools which are focused on on data, and although there are more and more data centric tools, perhaps an even more fundamental problem is the lack of interoperability between tools. And that leads to siloed data, which impedes the FAIR principles and also makes it difficult for researchers. Uh, next slide, please. So over the past uh, 10 years or so, we've been working at, at our space on trying to address, uh, do our best to make a contribution to addressing this problem. So our space, is a digital research platform that's designed to interoperate with and connect with research infrastructure. So if you look at this graphic here, um, if you let's ignore the purple ones at the top, we'll come back to those. Uh, but our space itself consists of four components, uh, an electronic lab notebook, uh, which again, Rob will show you uh, briefly, uh, a sample management system. So you can, you can, you can, um, manage your experiments in the electronic lab notebook. You can manage your physical samples in the inventory system and the two are connected. Third, the ecosystem of tools you see depicted here, which I'll go into in a minute. And fourth, a set of APIs, which allow for extensibility and further integrations. 
So just going kind of starting on the left here, uh, it's critical when you're documenting your research, you don't want to have all of your uh, data connect, uh, collected in something like our space because it's probably already stored somewhere else in a structured and maybe more convenient fashion, especially if it's big data, you don't want to be moving it around. But it's important as you document your research, if you're a biologist or a chemist or an, someone doing ecology or environmental studies or uh, in fields like that, uh, to be able to associate your the data that's, that's uh, stored externally with uh, the write-up of your experiments in our space. So we make it possible to link to uh, file stores. Um, we also have an integration with IROD. Some of you may be familiar with IROD's, I'm not sure, but IROD's is a kind of virtual file management system which can crawl file stores. So the benefit of the IROD's integration is that uh, if you, it's great if you can link to data from externally, but if the if the file location moves, oftentimes the, um, the link will break. But with IROD's it tracks the locations of the links so it maintains the, the integrity of the links. And then we also integrate with uh, commercial uh, file sharing uh, apps, uh, as well as open source ones, so, or some commercial and some open source, so things like Google Drive and Dropbox, as well as uh, OwnCloud and NextCloud. Um, then we also have uh, integrations with kind of specialist tools for, to support particular workflows. So Pyrite is an animal colony management system, so you can um, integrate link to data uh, that you're, if you're using animals in your experiments, a cluster market is an equipment scheduling tool. So you can link to uh, equipment uh, data relating to your, the equipment that you use in experiment. An exciting new one we have uh, coming up is FAMES, which is an offline field data capture tool. So you can capture data. Uh, let's say you're doing research in, in a remote area where there's no or even for that matter in a not so remote area where there's no connectivity, you can capture your data in a structured way, uh, whether it's uh, let's say your uh, oceanography or uh, agricultural field research, and then seamlessly pass it using a common templates from FAMES into our space when you're, when you're back in the lab. Uh, we also have an integration with Omiro, which is a widely used open source microscopy uh, tool. Uh, and, and we have, um, other integrations as well, including with with protocols IO. So those are kind of integrations with other other data sources. And then if you look at the purple ones at the top, and that's really the focus of our of our uh, of our talk today, uh, we integrate with with data management plans and repositories. Repositories are kind of really the starting point because in order to verify data, it's important for the data to be get into a repository where it can be discovered, queried, reused. Uh, to enhance reproducibility. So as you can see from the graphic, we have integrations with um, four of the main generalist repositories, uh, including Zenodo. And that actually came about as part of the project we did with Argos, and we'll be talking about that more. And then we also integrate with uh, data management planning tools. And today the focus is on in Argos. Thank you, next slide, please. So our mission, as uh, I think is probably implicit from the previous discussion, we feel that our mission uh, at ResearchSpace, which is the company that produces our space, is to enable streamlined passage of data and associated metadata throughout the research lifecycle. And I really haven't talked much about metadata because that actually that's one of our major focuses at the moment, but I think uh, Rob may touch on that in his demonstration. Uh, next slide, please. So, if you so, what does this mean in practice? So we deploy at institutions, at universities, and research institutes. Our users, if you will, are the chemists, the biologists, people doing in, in environmental studies, ecology, um, medicine, those kind of things. But the uh, the customer, the engagement partner, is the research institution, uh, which typically is either a university or research institute like the Leibniz Institutes, the Helmholtz Institutes in, in Germany, for example. And again, our mission is to try to facilitate a movement, easy passage of data throughout the research life cycle. So here's the one depiction of the research life cycle, life cycle uh, graphic, which everyone has seen. And this is just an, uh, an, inter, uh, an example of how our space actually interfaces with other tools and other research infrastructure 
that is used in a, a, a large research um, institution. And again, uh, the, the details may differ, but the categories of things are likely to be the same. And this shows this shows how our space is is optimized and designed to interface with other parts of the research infrastructure that'll be deployed at a large research institution. Uh, next slide, please. So, so currently our deployments are at, at inst research institutions, but uh, as as everyone can see, I think there's a movement to multi uh, multi-institutional to national and EOSC level research infrastructure. And we're now we're now actively exploring and beginning to get involved with um, integrating our space with research infrastructure at the national and EOSC levels. And this is a, uh, we have a proposal in with um, with about with 23 others, uh, but for our space to become uh, one of the core components of what's proposed for a Norwegian uh, research commons. Uh, so the process is similar to the same process, of course, that happens at the university, the plan, collect, share and reuse, publish. Uh, and again, I, I'm not proposing to go into a lot of detail here, but you can see our spaces is, is, can play a role in a, in, a, in a broader infrastructure, which is not just based on an institution. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and another example of, a, of an EOSC level e infrastructure would be uh, the EU DAT collaborative data, collaborative data infrastructure, which possibly uh, some of you are familiar with. And again, actually, the research lifecycle is is quite quite similar to what what it is in the universe. It is the same research lifecycle. It's just, but the tools are being provided uh, outside the institution for people uh, people to use. And again, if you look if you look at the the stages you've got data management, uh, data deposit, discovery, identifiers. It's quite similar, and again, um, the notion is that uh, that our space uh, would would act as a facilitator of, of flows of data throughout these other uh, various other resources. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now let me come to the second part. The main part of the uh, discussion today is the R space Argos integration, about which we're very excited, um, and. The, this is the idea, uh, as Ellie uh, so eloquently phrased it, uh, was to work together to try to bridge the planning, active research, and post-research stages of the cycle to capture the evolution of research outputs and practices in published data management plans. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, this is a bit of a preview, if you will, of what Rob is going to show you in, in, in more detail. Um, and I, I thought we'll show you some screenshots from our space, which hopefully will uh, give you some idea of, of what our space is like, and then it will become a lot clearer when when Rob actually does his um, his presentation. But the first point to note is that this is an institutional solution, uh, so it's possible it, to deliver this to your researchers at a at an institutional level. So I don't have a screenshot here, but the first stage in uh, in enabling uh, our space in Argos to to be used by your researchers. Is that a sys, an R space sysadmin will enable and configure the Argos integration on on the particular institutional R space server? Uh, next slide, please. And then the workflow is uh, is fairly simple. Uh, so step one is to and these are these are actually screenshots from R space. Step one is to is to import uh, a DMP from Argos into R space, and you can see. Here, a simple list. Uh, next slide, please. And you can also, when you're doing the import, you can take advantage of Argos's powerful uh, search parameters. So you can search uh, via a number of filters by, by uh, this is searching, searching in Argos by label, grant, funder, collaborators, and then choose the, the, the DMP that you want. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you then uh, complete the import by selecting uh, whatever DMP you'd like to import. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, our space that will uh, Rob is going to show this in more detail. But we have a, we have a special place. Our space gallery is is uh, is where your files are stored in our space. And as you can see on the left, highlighted there, we have uh, our space galleries divided into a number of sections. We have a special section for storing DMPs. Um, so your DMP, once you import it, will be stored in the R space gallery. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then I haven't I haven't actually gone through the screenshots for this, but you then go through, uh, if you like, you have the ability, and this is important because this really helps to facilitate the, the mission that described was described earlier. You can associate your DMP with the actual documents that are relevant to the DMP. So you have a DMP, then you actually carry out the research in a project and document it in our space. And you can associate that DMP with the research that you carried out. Uh, and you do that by opening or creating a document. Uh, then you simply uh, have the option to insert from the R space gallery. Uh, and then you choose your DMP. And uh, there's a link to the DMP in that document. So that becomes the DMP link becomes part of that document. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then there's also a nice um, uh, audit uh, kind of accountability, searchability feature that we have. Uh, so the information, uh, the, the information um, about the DMP will show you all the documents to which that DMP has been linked. So perhaps you linked that DMP to several documents because they were all relevant to it. That information will be available to you and is it's, it is it um, is included in the DMP itself. Next slide, please. And then um, finally. And this is a critical part of the of the workflow. And I mentioned earlier, we actually did an integration with Zenodo in conjunction with the integration with Argos. So it's also possible to asso associate uh, your export. What at the end of the at the end, presumably at some point, again, in order to comply with fair principles, the researcher might want to uh, export uh, the data in a particular project, the data sets to a repository like Zenodo, and you can associate the export with the uh, with the data management plan. That's part of that. Uh, that's part of that project. Uh, next slide, please. So, finally, be, just before I pass on to Rob, just mention. So, this is what you're going to see today is the first stage of the integration, but we have some ideas for future enhancements, which will um, which we'll be working on. Um, and these include, uh, first of all, uh, an indication of when a DMP has changed. So to make it more of a uh, automatically updating more of a, of a living record and a mechanism for updating the version of the DMP in our space. Uh, second, uh, an automatic notification to Argos when a deposit with an Argos DMP is made from our space to a repository. Again, a nice, uh, nice audit function. Um, then also some things within our space itself, um, sh the sharing of imported DAPs within a, a group in our space, so that it becomes a, re a group resource as opposed to something which is most relevant into the individual who um, who created the DMP. Uh, and then actually something which we're interested in, really interested in having this broader discussion with people involved in data creators like data stewards, we're planning, um, a data curator role in our space. There seem to be lots and lots of opportunities to have data curation uh, uh, baked into our space. Um, so, as part of that overall plan, uh, we we would think about a, a dashboard for monitoring DMPs usage during the active research uh, across a whole organization. So, it would be again a organizational feature as well. And that is my last slide. So, thank you for listening, and I will pass it over to Rob. Uh, you're mute, Rob. First of all, yeah, there we go. Hello, everyone. I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I'm actually from the UK originally, but I came to the US to do my graduate work here, and I ended up settling in the United States. So I'm going to very briefly show you an introduction of our space and show you how this integration works. I'm actually going to turn off my video to maximize the bandwidth that's available for both audio and screen share, but I wanted to say hi first, so you know I'm a real human being and not uh, an AI or anything like that. So I'll turn off my video and I will share my screen. So I'm going to share my uh, entire desktop here. And OK, so can everybody see my Chrome browser moving left to right now? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, so this is our space. I'm already logged in. But I also wanted to show you that uh, for this demonstration, we're using 
your sandbox version of Argos, but that already has some demonstration DMPs installed into it. And here is the sandbox version of Zenodo. And I'm showing you this initially to show you that this is, uh, my account here is empty. So there are no uh, data deposits dropped into this account currently. I just deleted them all earlier so that we're starting with a nice clean palette here. And you can see that there's nothing in here currently. Okay, so this is our space. I'm already logged in. When you log into our space, you're brought to an area called the workspace. So this is where you create our space documents that typically would be organized into either folders or notebooks. And these are designed to tell the story of your research. So uh, our space really in many ways is sort of at least three products in one. In the workspace area, you can use this for taking detailed notes and creating rich content that describe what you've done in the lab. In the gallery section, we use this like the hard drive of our space. This is where you can keep any and all files in any format from any source. And you can organize these hierarchically into folders if you want to. So the gallery is sort of replacing something like Dropbox or G Drive or OneDrive. It's simply a place where you can keep your files. Files are sorted by uh, file type. And you can do things like uh, for image files, you can easily view those. Or if you pick a file that has a slightly higher resolution, so if I search for a subfolder and I pick one of my favorite images and I take a look at it. If I want to, I can zoom in and see this in all of its high resolution glory right within the browser. I don't have to muck around downloading this and opening it up in some external uh, application. There are areas for messaging, getting messages from the system and from your colleagues. And there's an apps area where you can configure some of our many integrations as Rory alluded to. So in here, you can configure where you might get uh, data from or where you might link to data. You can link to data in external sources like uh, Dropbox or Box if you want to. You can import protocols from protocols.io or you could connect to an Omero server to link to uh, sets or individual images that are held there. We also can configure here our various repositories that we might send things to, including Dataverse and of course, uh, Zenodo. So, um, and then we also have a detailed inventory area. We're actually very proud of our inventory area, and we won't be talking about this today. Unfortunately, it's not really the focus of today's talk, but for no additional cost, users of our space get access to this extremely sophisticated, modern and innovative inventory system, which can be used for tracking any large set of any real or conceptual entities that you work with in your research and showing precisely how those different items have been used in your experiments and workflows. So I can, for example, swap the inventory system into tree mode, which makes it extremely intuitive. And then once I've done that, if I want to, I can browse around in my various containers looking for items, just the same way that on my computer, I might browse through folders looking for files. So for example, here I can see that we have a, a room and in that room there are freezers and in those freezers there are shelves and on those shelves there are freezer boxes and I could go ahead and take a closer look at a freezer box and see a little map of the box to understand where all of my items are. And I can do things like select individual items here and move them around or edit them or customize them or record metadata about them or do whatever I want. And then I can build all of these different things into sets and use those sets of items and experiments and track exactly how I've used those in the audit trail over time. I can even see the entire history of a single sample and understand who's accessed it, which experiments they've used it in and where it currently is. Anything that I really want to do uh, with my inventory system, I can do easily from here. So, uh, and then information about those samples may be embedded in different documents. So as an example, if I take a look at this content example document, you can see here that within the note-taking area of our space, I can create rich formatted text. <clears throat> I can embed images. I can embed uh, files of all types. I can easily either view these using the technology built right into our space, or in the case of uh, MS Word or Excel files, I can easily also view those or start editing, editing them with our built-in integration with uh, Microsoft Office Online. We also support open source alternatives like Collabra Online. I can create uh, tables and calculations. I can drop images to, into those tables to control the layout of my page. I can copy and paste in uh, chunks of table or chunks of content or images from external sources and easily post paste those onto the page. I can also use uh, innovative content creation tools. Like for example, I can, as a shortcut, I can simply type a backspace key to get access to a range of different elements that I could drop onto this page, including special characters, code samples, images from the gallery, images from my computer, equations built using a built-in LaTeX editor, or really whatever I want, including things like links to external data held outside of our space. 
And in this case, by using the backslash key, I can do all of that without taking my fingers off the keyboard even, which is very nice. I can also see over here an immediate list of sets of different samples that I've associated with this document. Like for example, here, if I click this one, we can see here is a list of uh, pancreas sections that are associated with this experiment. And if I want to, I could uh, export a summary CSV file of these, or I could click on this link here, jump to that item in the inventory system to immediately learn more about it. And in fact, I can even from here tell um, immediately which experiments that particular sample has been used in. Okay, so if I switch now back to the gallery. So the gallery is good at storing a number of things. It can be used to store any file in any format. You can add these manually. You can drag and drop them in. You can bring up a file chooser. You can interact with your mobile device to add things like pictures or voice notes directly through the operating system of your mobile device. You'll also see that you can import things from various different sources. In this case, this server is configured to import DMPs from Argus. So if I choose that option, I'll see a list of DMPs. These are all actually test DMPs associated with the Sandbox Argos server. These are not actual production uh, DMPs. And I could sort these by label or by grant, or I could search for a particular funder, or there are other ways that I can uh, look through this list to find the one that I'm looking for. I can select an item at any time, and then I can click Import, and that will add the item to a special DMP area of my um, gallery. So in this case, you can see in this, in this gallery area, we have a mixture of DMPs that have come. Some of these have come from DMP, uh, DMP online, sorry, DMP tool, and others have come from uh, Argos. Like this one, for example, came from the Argos system earlier. And if I'd like to associate this with an experiment, I can easily do that. So I could go back to my workspace. I can choose a particular document. Uh, you can see here from, from here, I can do things like duplicate that document, move it to a new location. I can delete it, but it will actually still stay on the server because our space is fully 21 CFR 11 and also Annex 11 compliant. I could export this in a sort in a number of different formats, as we'll see in a moment. Um, but for now, if I just click on this document to open it, one of the things that I could do is I could say how I'm using the DMP in the context of the study. So I could say here is the DMP used to define this. Study. And now if I want to, I could very easily say insert from gallery. I can go to the DMP area. I can choose the DMP I imported earlier and say insert or drop it in here as a little uh, icon representing the file. Now, if I want to, oh, actually, I actually also inserted that right into the middle of a word. So let's actually fix that too as well. Um, I'll just do that by saying here, get rid of that. And actually I can cut it from this location and put it where I meant to put it in the first place, which is right here. So uh, now what I can do is if I want to, I could select this and I could look at the info for it. And as Rory alluded to, I can say show link documents. And it's going to tell me that so far I've associated this DMP with one R-Space document. And in fact, that's the R-Space document that I'm working on right now. Here's the unique R-Space ID and here's the corresponding unique ID on that particular page. But if I associated this DMP with other documents, they'd all appear uh, right here in this list. Okay, so I'm going to save this now. So one of the things I can do from RSpace is I can easily export my work at any time in any one of a number of different formats. I can uh, do that by either from the document itself, clicking export, or I can go back to the workspace. And I can build a cohort of data that I'd like to export by selecting it using the uh, corresponding checkboxes. So I'm going to go back to the workspace. And I could go ahead and select any documents I wanted. I could select more than one. I could select uh, folders. I could select notebooks. I could even select everything that I see on the page here. Or I could select a cohort of data using our advanced search engine. I could build a set of different things here that I'd like to export as a single data deposit. In this case, for brevity, I'll just select one document and I'll say, I'd like to export this document. I can now go ahead and choose a format for that export. And then I can decide here that I would like to send this out to a repository. I also, actually, I'm going to go back one step. I also have the option to include file store links. So what's this talking about? Well, if I go back to the document and take a look at it, one of the things you can do in our space is you can link to external files or data sets that are outside of our space held in university governed file stores like SMB or SFTP file stores. 
or even in IROD's managed uh, file systems too as well. So in this case, you can see here, we have a couple of links to some external file store, fi files held outside of our space. And if I click that link, it will tell me exactly where that file is kept. In this case, it's kept in an, an SMB file store somewhere outside of our space. So when I export this document, I can, if I want to, choose to tell our space to reach out to those external files grab them and retrieve them from wherever they are outside of our space and then bring them in and include those along with everything else that you see on this page in our export. It's actually a very, very nice trick to let you reunite data files in a number of different external uh, locations and bring them all together in the repository. So I'll select the item again and say export, choose my format, say that I'd like to send it to an external repository and also say that I'd like to include any external files that are held elsewhere outside of our space. Then I'll say next. Uh, the system will allow me to choose what kind of repository I'd like to send it to. I'll choose Zenodo. And I can also go ahead and say, I'd like to associate this deposit with a particular DMP that I've previously imported. I'm going to choose this one. Um, I'm actually not choosing this one at random. The reason why I'm choosing this particular file is if I open a new window, I will briefly mention that there is a little feature here that's, that's nice, but it's a bit of a gotcha if you're not careful. These DMPs that I've previously imported, they've come from a, uh, a sandbox Argos instance, not the main production server. Um, this, this association of a DMP with your export will only work if the uh, DMP that we're exporting has already been published and has a, a, a valid Zenodo DOI already associated with it. And so in this case, I, I picked this particular DMP because in this case, this one I already know does in fact have a Zenodo digital identifier associated with it. And I could see that if I went to back to uh, Argos and took a look at the, uh, that particular file, I'd be able to see a Zenodo uh, uh, ID associated with that particular DMP if I were to rummage around in here and find it. Okay, so we've chosen our DMP that we'll be associating with this data bundle. I can give it a name, let's say Argos export demo, just so it'll be easy to find. And for description, for brevity, I'll just drop that in there. But normally I'd put in a proper detailed uh, description. I can at this point also access um, standard industry specific tags to associate with this document to make it more findable in the future. Now, this is a feature that's fully supported in our workflow with Dataverse. And it, it is, in fact, also featured in with our workflow with Zenodo too as well. So I could add a tag. And I could go ahead and I could say, I'd like to add an, an, a, some sort of uh, data tag that will be drawn not from our space, but actually this will be drawn from known industry standard tagging sites, uh, specifically BioPortal in this case. So for example, I could say this is Nash with fibrosis. And you'll see that the system is actually searching the BioPortal controlled vocabulary site for a corresponding tag. And I can actually choose that and tag my deposit with this uh, particular tag. Now, this is not just any old tag. This is an, you know, a worldwide recognized industry standard tag that I've selected here that I'm now going to associate with this deposit. Now I'll say next, uh, the system will check to make sure that I'm logged into any of the external file stores that I've, uh, I've opted to include some files from. So I'm going to log into that uh, system. Of course, I have no idea what my credentials are, but that's okay. I can look them up quickly here. Okay, so now I'm logging into the external file system where there are some external files that are not currently part of our space, but I'd like to include those in this deposit. So I'll ask the system to scan if it sees any. It says, yes, I found these files. Would you like to include those in the export? I'll say yes. Okay, so now I can click export. Behind the scenes, our space will take whatever I've selected and it will also pull in those external files from an external source. It'll bundle the whole lot up together as a single industry standard zip file and then it's going to send the whole lot off to Zenodo. And once that process is complete, with a little bit of luck here, I will get a notification telling me, hey, uh, that export worked. And not only that, it's going to include in this notification a link directly to where it's put that particular export. So I can click that link, and I'll be taken to Zenodo. And this, again, is my Zenodo account here. And sure enough, you can see here, here's the deposit that, was, uh, that I've now added to my Sandbox Zenodo instance. And if I want to, I could actually also go through here and adjust uh, these metadata settings more if I wanted to. As you know, there are a number of different 
uh, places here where I can add additional metadata or do other things to better uh, identify this data. And here is a link to the zip file that I've just associated with this uh, Zenodo repository. And if I click that, it will actually download that zip file to my local computer. Now the tag that I included has also been sent along, but I won't see that until I actually publish this repository and make it available. And when I do that, that tag, in this case, you may recall, I added a tag of Nash with fibrosis, that will actually be dropped into the subject field of the metadata of this deposit um, so that people searching Zenodo would be able to find it by performing a search for subject Nash with fibrosis. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, the process as it is today. Um, I hope that was useful for you and that it will give you some idea of exactly how this works. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer those. Thank you very much, uh, Rob and Rory, uh, for the overview and for the you know more uh, for guiding us through like the workflows uh, of our space and how we can use them to add our DMP and connect uh, our space uh, collection and activity with our DMPs. Um, let's see. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, please raise your hand and feel free to. Speak up. I cannot see you now. I can see. I don't know if um, if uh, you have used our space uh, before, for example. That's a, a good uh, question. Like to get an idea if you were familiar already before. You're hearing about our space. Well, it seems like that must have been crystal clear for everybody since I see no hands raised or questions asked. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, yeah. Well, um, let's see. So, um, I have a question. Uh, I partly know the answer, but I'm not sure, so I will, <laughs> I will raise it. So, our space uh, is not open source, right? Oh, that is a fabulous question. Well, Lord, yeah, take that one? yeah, I'll take it. Yes, uh, it's, at the moment it's not, but we've been um, spending. We've been working hard on the transition to open source since about uh, March of last year. And we will transition to open source in April. And in fact, next, or I think either this, I think this week, we have the public first public announcement coming out. So, so it's a huge, a huge. It was a huge amount of work. It's a huge transition for us, but we are really looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, so, yes, um, we're, and, and we're actually on target to meet the April date. Which, given the amount of work that's involved, it's it's a miracle. But we are we are on course to meet the April, uh, the April date. So we will be open source quite soon. Now, in, in Very good to know. Yeah. In some ways, related to the open sourcing of our space, there's one very important feature that we haven't really discussed. Rory didn't really mention it in any great detail, but I am eager to show it to you. And that's the fact that even today, our space features from uh, the profile page every user can get immediate access to our existing um, full-featured, quite sophisticated uh, open APIs. And you can use these to currently to push or pull data into or out of our space to any other data source. And this is worth mentioning today because, of course, this is an important part really of verification of data because it means that you can allow this data to be freely exchangeable with any other system. There are APIs both for ELN and there is actually even more advanced APIs for the inventory system. Uh, the logic here being that we, we think it's quite likely that people will want to move samples into and out of legacy uh, inventory systems or into and out of things like purchasing systems so that they can track exactly what materials they're using and how those materials have been used. So uh, this inventory is of, this uh, API is available today. Um, and so if you wanted to work with RSpace to access and exchange data with something you already work with, you could do that now with the API, but it will be even easier after we go open source. And we're also hoping that once we're open source, this, these APIs will continue to develop very quickly as they're modified and improved by the open source community 
to make our space an incredibly flexible and interactive tool that will allow you to uh, integrate it with almost anything. So Ellie, since you asked, we might, if, if since I guess we have a bit of time, I could perhaps um, explain that our thinking behind going open source, would that, would that be possibly useful or should I do that? Yes, but I see. Uh, there oh, there's a, a question now. Oh, great. Yeah, perfect. Yes, yes. Yeah. There is a piece. Uh, oh, so thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I had not known of our space before, so um, I think it's it's fascinating. Um, I think it's a wonderful feature to be able to link DMPs to our documents. There's one question that I would like to ask. Where do all the files, where are all the files located? Uh, oh. Is it on site um, at the department, the, the institution, the organization where our space is installed or is it somewhere uh, on the cloud? Um, the answer is it's entirely up to you, Teresa. Um, our, each our space customer and user gets their own unique private personal server and that server can be installed wherever you want. It can be installed on premise as many of our customers do, especially European customers. It can be installed yep. on a cloud host of your choice that you would manage, or it can be installed on an Amazon Web Services instance that we manage for you entirely. The last one is by far the most convenient way to do it for, for the institution, because if you have us manage your own Amazon slice, that comes with unlimited data storage, and there's literally nothing really for you or your IT team to do. We manage the entire thing for you. All you need is a URL to log into your own personal server, that server is unique, it's private, your data is not mixed with other files, and all of the files that you've added to our space and all of the data you've created there is physically kept on that server, but the, uh, the location of that server ultimately is up to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that sounds great. Um, um, as, as you mentioned, um, I think in Europe, and um, I think I'm, I'm located in, in, in Sweden, um, yeah, the location, the security, the information security of data is an important question. So um, therefore, this is an important point. Um, and that is on a different level as um, all the user features um, that researchers can access um, uh, to work with their data and to collaborate with colleagues and those sorts of things. Um, of course. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you can rest assured that we've done many large deployments to large enterprise organizations and institutions all over Europe. We are completely on top of data privacy, data security, GDPR issues, other kinds of issues that are related to that, that are important to the institutions. And you can be sure, of course, that during the RFP phase and the selection of a solution for each university, of course, the privacy, data management, and security teams of those institutions uh, dove deeply into our space and the research based company that builds it to make sure that we've thought of all these things and we have all of those aspects of the deployment under control. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions, maybe? Um, Rory, maybe you want to go ahead with uh, open source. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So just kind of a bit of background on why we're why we're going open source. So there are several several reasons. Probably the most pressing reason was that we were getting more and more um, requests from our for existing universities and potential and potential universities that were interested in our space to go open source because their researcher communities preferred using open source um, products. So that was that was probably the most pressing thing. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned, we're now actively exploring, including in Sweden, as it happens, with um, national research, the NRENs, the national research um, infrastructure providers, about having our space deployed as part of a, a national or, or at an EOSC level uh, infrastructure. And again, being open source in that case is pretty much a prerequisite. If you're not open source, they won't they won't even consider um, working with you. So so those so those were kind of uh, kind of business opportunities, if you will, which we kind of, we kind of had to do it. 
there are two additional reasons which are also also important. Uh, one is um, there's the, uh, as you know there there is uh, research done uh, which is managed or overseen by data stewards and others at, at research institutions, but there are also um, projects which are kind of project based and not institutional based. I'm thinking of like the NFDIs in Germany, I think are the, are the primary example where a lot of the NFDIs, or in fact, all of the NFDIs are now developing their own research infrastructure. And so they only use open source tools. And right now, because our space is an open source, although it might be an attractive um, product, as you can see, it's got lots of useful capabilities because it's not open source, they, they can't work that they won't work with it. So, uh, we think that there's an opportunity for our space to be used outside the institutional context in these in these projects. Uh, again, we won't be we won't get any income from that, but that's okay because we want our space to be part of the, you know, part of the innovation that's going on there. Um, and and that also relates to the other another benefit, which is one of the things we've done, as you can see, we've, it's, we've, we've done a lot of, a huge number of integrations ourselves as well as product development. Uh, but the more you do, the more people want. And so our space has multiple capabilities, which is great. But uh, for each of those capabilities, then people say, oh, this is really nice. And could you add this? Could you add that? And pretty soon it just becomes impossible for us to, uh, to manage all the requests for additional features and, and capabilities. So once the product is open source and the community is able uh, begins to to grow around our space, then that will also lead to accelerated uh, product development. So yeah, so those are some of the considerations we had when we made the decision about a year ago to go open source. Thank you, Rory. Uh, and I think we have another. Um, well, well, it's great. I I, I like saying you know. Um, small or medium and uh, large uh, understanding you know where there is this community's heading uh, uh, more open uh, science uh, and uh, open ecosystems and uh, I, I I applaud you for you know taking this step uh, uh, towards uh, open source yeah uh, and I I know that it's not easy to change everything and yeah uh, well well done <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Um, there is a question though uh, in the chat uh, by Julia. Hello, congrats for the amazing job and the very interesting presentation. Can single researchers decide to use our space or it's necessary an institutional committee? Well, yes, single user researchers can already decide to use our space um, even before we're open source. We have what's called the community version of our space, which is completely free and anybody can sign up for an account. So it's we already offer, in the sense we've already, we've always had this community version. It's not open source, so it doesn't enable open development, but in terms of open usage, it is. So it's that's already possible. And in fact, I will I think Rob, yes. The <laughs> there we go. Thank There's you. a URL in the, uh, the chat area for you. Thank you also for showing that uh, in your screen. I should say though that uh, the R space free community version does not include the uh, the innovative inventory system. So this will give you a basic and pretty good usable experience of R space. We have thousands of uh, individual users using it on this server. Uh, by the way, this will also give you a sense of the good performance of the system too as well, because we have probably 20,000 registered users on this uh, server. And they're mainly things like uh, Divorce, uh, sort of uh, orphaned graduate students whose PI has not yet made the commitment to buy an ELN or access to the full version of our space. But at any one time, there might be a thousand or more people logged into the system using it. And this is a relatively modestly uh, uh, provisioned server too as well. And so you'll be able to see that this performs well, even under heavy load with thousands of people using it simultaneously. Anyway, uh, we have lots of people using this as their main production server. And then if you do decide to buy your own instance of the system on your own private server, you can actually easily migrate your data from this public version to the new server so that you can then pick up right where you left off and continue using it in the, the full environment that would include the inventory system. Thank you. 
Um, any question? Now that we are getting warm, <laughs> good questions. No. Well, uh, we will leave. Um, uh, we will. We will leave. Can we, Rory and Rob? Can we leave uh, the email? Where can uh, we? How can we contact you if we need more information in the future? Yeah, can I can do that. Thank you. And I'll. I'll. Um. Oh, you already have a copy of the slides, so you can feel free to post the slides if if you'd like. Thank you very much. Oh, we have we have a question. Okay, Teresa, sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a pretty general question. What potential do you see um, that RS space has for data-driven science, for data-driven life science as a tool for data-driven research? Well, well I mean, uh -huh. you want to go ahead, Rory? Yeah, sure. I Well, I am I think uh, in um, terms... I think this is for curiosity. Um, um, uh, so I, um, as I said, I, I have no background knowledge about our space. Today is the first time that I hear about it. Um, so this is not meant to be a nasty question. Yeah, no, um, no. I think it. I, the, so I think please. the. Uh, I think the. Um, uh, so I think it. I mean, <laughs> it has huge potential, and and the potential is already being realized. I mean, as I said, the to us the core the core mission has always been to enable streamlined flows of data between tools. And the problem is that data is siloed in various tools which aren't open. And so, by by doing the things that you've seen our space is able to do, depositing uh, aggregating data from different sources and then making it possible to deposit that data in data repositories, that's already a massive step forward in terms of, of data-driven science and reproducibility. The other thing, I think, I don't know if this is part of your question, but we, we constantly get asked now, what about AI? What about AI? What's your AI story? So I think the story there, I tried once before to share my screen. I'm going to try again. I'll probably fail. Uh, no, I won't even try. Um, but um, so I think the AI story is, is not so much uh, using AI inside our space. It's it comes down to the data data aggregation and data discovery benefits that you get uh, using our space. So one of the things that we're doing now with with the IRODS integration, we're doing a second stage of the IRODS integration, which enables you to export data from our space to IRODS. And IRODS is a is a virtual file management system which can track um, up to billions of files. So they could IRODS could could see all the files, i.e. all the data that's produced in an entire university, for example, or in an entire biodiversity project. And by and by enabling the export from our space into something like IRODS and associated metadata, which enables discoverability, you then massively increase the kind of intelligent, if you will, um, data pools, which AI engines can access. Uh, for things like medical research and all, all different kinds of research. So I think the the traditional story that we've had of uh, data passing throughout the life cycle in a streamlined way is already a huge benefit to data-driven science. And the kinds of things we're working on with IRODS will um, facilitate... Um, actually, I, I, I won't be able to get it now, but there, we have a really nice graphic. Someone at, at University College London, which is, as you can see, one of our customers, produced a really nice graphic of how they see the data funnel of all the data in UCL coming through our space and then being accessible for, for AI engines. It kind of encapsulates that. And that, of course, would be a, a second stage uh, of ways in which our space can, can further. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Ellie later, and maybe you can find a way to share it with people. I don't know. I won't be able to get my hands so on it both, quickly. Both of these graphics that you saw on the shared screen right now, these are both in the uh, the PowerPoint that Rory gave earlier, and I'm sure he'll probably make that available for distribution after this call. 
but the, the graphics give you some idea of what we ultimately think will be the, the story for data sharing. But speaking as a former bench scientist and a graduate student from Ohio State University who is uh, involved in, in many different aspects of research that both in the life sciences, but also in uh, educational and pedagogic research. What was very clear to me is that although there are various different ways to record data and hold data and store data, no one has really up until now thought about the entire story, which is trying to give a single tool to busy graduate students to allow them to manage their data from the planning stage when you're first making a data management plan, all the way through then from the early bench stages where you're doing trial runs, where you're doing experiments that fail, where you're doing experiments that yield useful data, and then ultimately um, using that central core bench tool, our space, which is available to use both on workstations and it's also very mobile friendly. You can use it on tablets and other mobile devices while you're in the lab. Using that to then reach out and link to other types of data that you or your colleagues have stored elsewhere. And then ultimately to bring that whole story together, the plan, the bench research, the data held in external systems, bundle a whole lot up together and send it all out to a final resting place in a repository where other people can access, access it. That's really our vision. And it's the vision of many other institutions that are trying to find ways to do that, that are going to help make this easy and seamless for people to do it. And, and the, one of the key barriers here is in the past is most research at universities is done by graduate students. If this process is not simple and easy, and if it's not doable from a single central core tool that everybody uses every day, those graduate students simply are not going to do it. And I speak from sort of bitter experience of trying to locate the, the past data of graduate students at different institutions that I've been involved with, where they're really just very focused on getting their experiments done and graduating, and they don't really care that much about research data management. Our space makes that step easy for them, and it's going to make it much more likely that they're going to go to the trouble of properly documenting, managing, and eventually making available the data that they've created in the lab. So that's really our vision, I would say. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, I know that we have if there are more questions. We can take the last one now. Otherwise, um, any hands? Okay, or something like that. So thank you very much. Uh Rory, Rob, um it was uh it was lovely to to have you in, uh, joining our first community call first of all uh, and then um as as always uh, it's fascinating to see you know what you can do uh with our space and argos also um uh, inside our space and the other way around we are also uh, going to share in the future some um some plans that we have <laughs> let's say uh, so we can continue this collaboration. Um, yeah, um, our next call, yes, it's scheduled for uh, you know, 28th of February, and it will focus on the Open Science Trails project, which starts next week as the kickoff. Uh, so we'll have more to tell you about this project, which has one of the core components uh, that it uh, will work around is DMPs and actual massive actionable DMPs. So let's uh, yeah let's let's uh, reconvene uh, next month uh, for that. And thank you very much. Thank you again uh, for accepting the invitation, Rory and Rob. And thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, well, thank everyone. Thanks for having us, and uh, nice to meet everyone. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. We will follow up by email. Goodbye.